So the thing I want to talk about, possibly showing my kids, is the biochemistry of pi. We are literally going to talk about pi, pi with an E, not the number, okay? In biochemistry class, we talk about pi with an E, and the thing is, if you're doing any baking over Christmas, you're going to be doing biochemistry. And if you can understand some of what you're doing, you can actually um, be a better baker. It hasn't really worked for me. I'm not that good of a baker, but I, th I think that I could be if I really put my mind to it, okay? Um, the main thing about it is you're bringing together all the different kinds of biomolecules and you are rearranging them into a palatable con combination. Bread is really mostly, all of these are mostly statements. Bread is mostly protein in water. And what it is, is it's protein that's been inflated by expanding air. So instead of blowing up a balloon by your mouth, you make tons of little balloons out of the gluten protein, and then you use the heat of the oven to inflate all of those. And of course, if you inflate it too much, if they don't have enough strength, it doesn't work. And that's why bread is kind of hard to make. You're kind of walking a knife edge between something that will inflate enough but not be too tough. You know, it needs to be tough enough to hold up under the inflation. But really, it's like blowing balloons. So if you look at this, what's really cool to me is that if you change the ratios of the kind of protein and the kind of carbs that you're using, you get all of the different bakery items. So a baker is basically doing the same thing over and over again, except that you have different ratios of fats, sugars, and proteins. For example, if you look at bread, you can break it down to a ratio of five to three flour, which is protein, one kind of protein, plus three liquid. You know, water, and maybe you have some milk in there. Maybe you have a little bit of something else. But that's the primary thing you need. You need the right ratio to have the right kind of bubbles, okay? So let's look over at pi. If you compare pi, pi has three flour, one liquid, and two fat, which is butter or whatever, okay? So pi, when you look at it, it has less of one of the things and more of the other of the things when we're talking about protein than water. Can you see which one it is? Pi has less protein because you're going to a three to one ratio and it has um, uh, less liquid, but it has more fat. And what you're doing is you're basically putting more oils into it. And that's why pi is different than bread. It's oilier. So it also, uh, one of the distinct things, it has a lot less water, only a little less protein, but it has more fat. And that's why pie is more buttery than bread. Uh, you know, if you, bread is okay to eat for lunch. You know, pie, uh, you might not want to eat pie for lunch, although you can probably get away with it as leftovers, you know. And so if you look at the other ones, I just want, want to point out that the biscuit is like pie, but you have more liquid and less fat. And biscuits kind of between pie and bread. A muffin has sort of even amounts of each of them, and everyone's favorite is cookie, right? Cookie has a lot of protein, and it has the, a lot of fat, but it also has a lot of sugar relative to everything else. So each of these is a different chapter in biochemistry. Um, the other thing to point out, egg. Which category would you put egg under? If you're eating eggs, what, if, if you go to Starbucks and you buy eggs, what kind of box do they put it in? You ever notice that? Protein? Yeah, eggs are protein. And remember that eggs are, if you're talking about scrambled eggs, you're talking about protein denaturation. So you can actually, if you, um, if you're, you, you meet up with family for the holidays and you can explain some things about biochemistry um, as you're doing it, okay? So yeah, Suzanne. It would be better to eat cookies and bread if you're going after the carbs. Now, the question is, carbo-loading, how, uh, how much carbs do you need relative to other things? But yeah, actually, uh, carbo-loading for, for bread. Now, flour does have carbs in it, um, but it has uh, a high amount of protein as well. So that's the other thing. Flour is sort of a combination category. And so there's, it's not like bread has no carbs, but bread doesn't have as much sugar. And probably you'd be better off. I wonder if you can make like a special carbo-loading bread that's somewhere between bread and cookie. Probably just mix some sugar into it, honestly. So if you're going to carbo-load, yeah, you can. But realize that there might be more efficient ways to do it.
but also, um, you know, mess with your physiology at your own risk, I guess. So, <laughs> but I think it's kind of cool that something as sort of liberal arts-ish as bread making, you know, artisan kind of thing, can be reduced to certain kinds of ratios. But of course, I wouldn't trust a baker who only knows the ratios. It's, uh, these ratios are the basis of the art. They're not the complete expression of it. Okay, so uh, the thing about flour, is flour contains gluten, and that's the protein that is found in flour. Actually, flour is probably about half and half carbs and protein, now that I think about it. I'd have to look at it. It's definitely got a lot of the gluten, and that's why we have the issues with gluten, um, gluten reactivity and things like that. Gluten is essential for flour because it makes the network that holds everything else up. It's uh, two proteins, gliadin and glutenin. You mix it with water and you knead it together so the proteins sort of unfold and distribute. You're making sort of a thick solution of proteins. But when you knead it together, the thing about gluten that makes it special is that mechanical movement will actually unfold and refold the proteins. Remember we talked about sort of the extruded spider silk and things like that? In a sense, you're doing the same kind of thing. You're applying pressure to the sample, and you are literally refolding some of the proteins as you do it. You're changing their tertiary and quaternary interactions. And we just didn't know. We don't know for, for sure about all the interactions because it's very amorphous. It's not like you can do crystallography on a piece of bread, right? But these people have found out ways to make some crystal structures of some of these proteins. And so they talk about how they reorganize. So this is like the bread scientists. They go and they put bread under a microscope. And here's a freshly wetted dough. When you knead it, you develop these networks. You develop these fibers and these strands that are interrelated. That's why I say it's kind of like a, a sheet. It's more like a sheet of rubber. It polymerizes. And it makes these... Um, these strands that go together, and they're tough. They're also hard to digest. So the more you knead it, the more you're going to make the gluten that we talk about. Now, on a protein level, what we're talking about is that you, you are taking a protein that is like this. You know, you're bringing it to a slightly unfolded state, and you're stressing it out, and you're actually forming, look at this, amyloid fibrils. You know, as they unfold, some of them are forming beta strands. And remember how proteins will just do this. So the same thing in bread is the same kind of structure in amyloid fibrils. I'm sure there's some differences, but there is a deep similarity. So these filaments are not that different from the filaments that form in the brain for neurodegenerative diseases that um, involve protein issues, protein occlusions like that. Okay, so there's a really good book, by the way, Harold McGee's On Food and Cooking, which I have in my office. Um, it's a classic text about this, but many people have updated it recently with lots more pictures and videos and stuff like that. One of the th ways you can see this, sometimes you can actually see the fibers with your, the naked eye, not with a microscope. Like, for example, here's some sourdough bread that's risen. When you ro let it rise, you're letting the yeast produce gas. Rather than producing it by temperature, you're actually being a biochemist. And you're producing it by having the yeast in there that's producing and blowing up the balloons a little bit. And here they've blown it up, but you can still see the fiber structure inside that. That is tough. That is like amyloid fibrils. And so it's a tough protein structure. And again, it can be hard to digest. It turns out that these have disulfides and hydrophobic interactions, so there's even some disulfides holding those together. Suzanne? Yeah. You'd get like matzo bread. So in Passover, they um, didn't, well, they didn't let the dough rise. They still needed it, and so it would be flat, but it would be, um, I actually am not sure what happens if you take the dough that's supposed to be kneaded with a high flour content and you just let it go, but I think it would be relatively dense but very crumbly. You know, so it would be kind of like um, hardtack or something like that, like what the sailors used to eat. Does anybody else have any ideas about this? I think this is, uh, I'm sort of guessing, but uh, yeah, has anybody ever done it? You know, I mean, maybe if, you usually don't forget to knead the bread, but if you knead it more, it will be tougher and you will be progressively producing more of the protein. There's probably a little bit of it that just na naturally happens as soon as you make the wetted dough. Um, so you're increasing the strength, but it would be, I would predict, crumbly 
and um, not very palatable, you know. So. so, of course, we can do size exclusion chromatography, if you remember that. Um, we take the proteins from wheat gliadin, and they took some of the proteins, they took one sample where they treated it with heat and pressure, and that's like kneading the proteins, okay? But heat and pressure are a little bit like what happens when you both knead the proteins together and let them be at um, room temperature or even bake them. And then they also added 30% glycerol because that helps keep it in solution, you know? But they, that also, the glycerol itself, we talked about that in the fatty, um, the lipids chapter. But the glycerol itself is sort of goopy stuff. It's sort of thick, but it's also hydrogen bonding and soluble. So let's see what happened. If they just take the heat and pressure treated, you end up with stuff that actually makes it through a size exclusion column. And then you have these polymeric proteins that come out before. Remember for size exclusion, if it comes out before, what's the relationship in size? It's larger. What comes out first is bigger. And so that's why they're saying with confidence, these are monomeric and these are polymeric. So whatever's going on with the polymeric proteins that are joined together, if you just take the same sample and you add glycerol, the glycerol breaks them apart. And so you no longer have polymers, you have monomers. The cool thing about this, this is something that you can actually take and do a crystal structure or NMR structure of. And that's what they did. They actually took this. So adding glycerol makes the gluten soluble and makes it able to apply the protein chemistry techniques to it. And again, this is not um, super fancy science. It's adding glycerol. Uh, you know, it's, a, it's the kind of thing that really we could try in the lab. So try simple things in the lab. Sometimes they will allow you to take a problem that people couldn't look at before. You add glycerol, and suddenly you can look at the problem because you've got monomeric proteins. Then you get these structures. So this is, um, this is gliadin by itself. This is the glutenin by itself. And then they have mixtures of the two because that's more like the real, uh, the real issue when you have, you have both of those proteins together. So if you add the gliadin by itself and then you add the, um, you add the uh, glycerol, uh, and by the way, this is not the proteins mixed together. These are each the separate proteins and they're mixed together with glycerol. Let me uh, take that. That's a little bit confusing to me because I see gly and I don't think glycerol. Okay. But this is what happens if you just have one of the proteins and then you, you basically knead it. And you see what happens. You see these beta strands that are sort of joining together that you haven't seen before. And you see that it develops this sort of hexameric structure, you know, where you have sort of a more defined core, but you, you have them sort of mix, mixed and tangled together. That's what kneading will do. It will take a protein like this, and it will sort of start to tangle them together. The glutenin does the same, uh, same kind of thing. It's just not as pretty of a structure. But you can see that you have a, a multimeric structure where it's sort of all, all the secondary structure here is jumbled together. I think the difference between the two proteins is this one keeps its core and uh, sort of like the edges, the loops tangle. This one, I believe, completely unfolds. It has two subunits, and those just get all tangled up together. But really what you're doing is you're literally unfolding proteins when you're kneading bread. You're making them into fibrils. You're starting to tangle them up together like this. And so this is one of the things that is in gliadin and glutenin. They are not that great at being globular proteins. They actually uh, work really well. But this structure gives you a hint. If you're a biochemist looking at this structure, you can see something unusual about this. this is, so this is a short stretch of a fragment from gliadin. What do you see when you look at the amino acids? What's unusual about that? So it's very polar. That explains why it's soluble. And um, that explains one of, the re one of the reasons why this can go into solution. You can dissolve a lot of water in flour because it will, uh, it will react with it. And you have those, those polarities. Yeah, so you have a soluble peptide. It's not unusually soluble, probably. It's, we can say that about a lot of proteins. There's something about this. It's composition of amino acids. When you look back and forth, um, remember that each amino acid is supposed to be about a 1 in 20 chance of things happening. So if you see an amino acid more than once, that's unusual. If you see it three times, it's really weird. 
What kind of weird amino acid do you see multiple times up there? So you can see a couple of the glutamines. Those contribute to solubility. So there's glutamate and glutamine, and there's a glutamate again. So you have those contributing to solubility. Yeah, keep looking up and down. You don't see many aromatics, right? It's definitely not aromatics. What about this? And then this. And then that. Three prolines in a short stretch like that is not statistically expected. It's more prolines than you would expect. This particular fragment was chosen and was mapped out because they find out that people w who have a problem with gluten cannot digest this. They cannot break it down. And the reason why they can't break it down is because it's both soluble, but it's also high in proline content. And that means that it has a backbone. You see how these prolines are here. It's hard for proteases to find the place to go in and break it down. This is one of the reasons why this works well for making fibers that tangle up and form bread, but it also might be hard to digest for some people, especially depending on your gut microbes and things like that. So this is a hard to digest fragment because of the prolines make it hard to fit into proteases. Proteases can go after a backbone of all sorts, but if you're messing with the backbone like you are with proline, that you're changing the equation, this is no longer a hydrolyzable bond. So that actually combines um, concepts from how chymotrypsin works, if you remember how that works. And if you uh, see the chymotrypsin, it's hard to make a protease that goes after prolines and can break near prolines. This might be part of the reason for gluten intolerance. The other thing that you do, if you're doing croissants rather than bread, one of the things that you'll do, I like to let other people make croissants for me because it's so much work. Okay, So I like to buy croissants, but I don't like to make them. To make a croissant, apparently what you do, what they tell me you have to do, is you flatten out the bread, and you put butter on it, and then you fold it, right? Has anyone ever done this? Have, have you uh, done croissants? Okay, so was it a croissant, or was it some other kind of pastry? Okay, yeah, it's the same. Right. Yeah, if you take the number of times that you fold it, if you just do it like eight to ten times, you're getting thousands upon thousands of little layers. And the thing that the oil's doing is it's keeping the bread. Remember, the bread is protein. The bread is going to be semi-soluble, at least. The oil is putting hydrophobic layers, like a membrane, between each of the layers of protein. And if you do this, then the little inflation, you're basically putting little layers that will inflate, and they'll pull apart when the bread starts to rise and when it starts to be baked. And then you get, from the layers that you have, you get bigger bubbles. <coughs> Here you just don't have the bubbles as big. And that's really what it takes to make a croissant. There's a lot of other things that, that it takes to make a croissant well, but to make the structure of the croissant, that's what you need. You need the layers of oil. So pi dough, if you look at the ratios, it's sort of halfway networked. And what you do is you use one of these things, and you cut the butter into the flour. So you don't make layers, but you make particles of butter-covered protein. Okay, And uh, you're coating the proteins with lipids. So you're making little dots of protein networks that are suspended in a sea of wonderful butter. Okay. And you make that into, you roll that out, and you make that into pie. That's why a pie is a little bit like a croissant, but not exactly. You aren't making flat things. You're making round nuggets, OK? So what you do is you coat the flour with the butter. You make all these little pellets of flour that are suspended in a sea of butter. And what you do is you do something called streaking the dough. I'm not quite, does anybody know what this actually is, streaking the dough? I used to know, but I forgot. Anyways, what you do is you are, it's fraisage in French. OK, so I won't try to pronounce French. Um, but what you do is you have, it's not fully laminated. You don't have layers, but you have suspended little bubbles of this. I wonder if I'm losing, yeah, I don't know. I don't know where it is, but um, I, I thought I had a picture of it. But I think you flatten these out and you sort of mix them together. And so you end up with like little croissant-like flakes with a lot of butter, which is why pie is um, 
so uh, so good, but it's got lots of good stuff in it. And then the sugar that you add is not really structural. That's just for fun. Okay. So I guess, you, and that's why you can make savory pies, right? Because you need butter and protein to make a pie. Technically, the sugar is what you choose to add. So all that's the biochemistry that you can do if you want to stress bake or something like that. Um, and that reminds me of Christmas. There's actually a chapter, uh, chapter 10 and 11 type topic that reminds me of Christmas. I think it's really cool. So remember that liposomes are just basically big versions of vesicles that you can make. And they form naturally if you just put fatty acids in water, it's something uh, that has a hydrophobic and hydrophilic part. And if they're long and skinny, uh, then they will come together into membrane-like things. The interesting thing that happens is what happens if you mix two of these together? That They're compatible. They have compatible tails, but maybe they have different chemistries on the head groups. They will actually form some kind of phase separation that will happen. Depending on what you do, you can label one red and one green, and you can see these different patterns that result. These look like living cells. All they are is two different kinds of lipids, probably fatty acids of some sort. Um, I don't think they're even complex enough to be the uh, membrane lipids, but they might be. Actually, I think some of them are. So um, these are basically just membranes, though. They're simple membranes because they have two components. You mix them together, and they automatically make those cool shapes. And those look like little Christmas ornaments, you know? It's, they're really tiny Christmas ornaments. But I've always wondered about if you take a picture of this and hang it on your tree and tell everyone it's Christmas, or, uh, it's a Christmas ornament, they believe you, right? So uh, the, the coolest thing is if you take ceramid, cholesterol, and glycerophospholipid, this is why I know that these are triacylglycerides or something like a membrane lipid, um, because that's what ceramid and that's what glycerophospholipid is. This is um, a relatively simple composition. But it makes this star. So you literally can make a Christmas star ornament just by mixing three of the right lipids together. This domain, for whatever reason, results in a five-pointed symmetry like that. And it's just phase separation, like the lipid rafts that we were talking about, how certain lipids will self-associate. But it's all still liquid. So these are liquid flowing sort of structures. This is a paper about it. And this is what I want to show you what this paper is. The important thing about this paper is that it's really pretty simple. You're mixing a couple of lipids together, and you have it in a buffered salt solution. And then you can take, take them from one solution and put them in another solution, where the only difference is salt. No ATP, no ATPase, no proteins around at all, in fact. This is entirely chapter 10 and 11. Uh, so. But what happens is if, if you take this and you just transfer it from one salt solution to another, you get something that really looks alive. It's kind of like the counterpart to the cornstarch movie that we showed, where the cornstarch looks alive if you put energy into it and just let it shake and then disturb it a little bit. Here's where you're putting energy into it in a sense by transferring it through, from a high salt solution to a low salt solution. It has salt in the middle, and then you have osmotic pressure across the membrane that will be the driving force. Just based on that simple driving force, I want you to see what happens. For example, if you take it from, an, if you form it in an isotonic solution, then you take it to a hypotonic solution, you will start to see like micro domains forming, and then they'll like build up, and then it will like release some of the osmotic pressure, and then they'll disperse. And you'll end up with like a cycle where you have these shapes forming polka dots, forming and unforming. Again, this is just taking liposomes and moving them from salt to another. Now, after a while, they run out of gas. The osmotic pressure difference, like it will push on it, and then it will pop out, and then it will push on it again and pop out. So it'll go through the cycle like four or five times. Uh, so this definitely runs out of gas after a while, because it will equilibrate. First chapter concept, homeostasis and equilibrium. But when it's in a case where you have a bigger difference, or you're farther from equilibrium, you have something that looks very lifelike. And uh, it's just driven by membrane tension. It's driven by osmotic pressure. 